our scripture reading. Um, and my lesson for today, I wanted to take the opportunity to call to mind those who were not here yesterday, that one of our good members and friends of Unity at the Lake, Loa Faust, made her transition last Sunday, and there was a memorial service here at the church. It was a great delight to see many of her Unity friends and many neighbors, and her three daughters were here, and the sanctuary was almost filled to capacity. It was a great celebration of life, learning more about Loa's life, for many of us, like me, uh, Loa was a new friend of just the past year here at the church. But it was a great time of love and warmth and wonder in that person who was named Loa. And so I bring that up not only to inform you, but also inspire you in today's lesson we're going to talk about the outer limits or the greater limits of being. And I find it always helpful, as Dale mentioned, that when we have times, especially when it seems like several of our acquaintances, friends, or family members have made their transition, they've passed from this life, to have a sense of gratefulness because, you see, they have challenged us. We usually think in terms of their life, um, uh, knowing them in this world. But in their passing, they have challenged us to see the greater life. To see beyond this physical world that we know so well and deal with each and every day and realize that that landscape or horizon of life is infinite for each one of us. And so when a friend passes, they're not saying in an audible voice, but an inner voice. Look beyond the day to day. See how great is God's creation. So I know I am grateful for low opposing that question to me. Today we have our reading from the Gospel of John. We've been following the Gospel of John through the Revised Common Lectionary. These are scriptures. Um, fortunately for you, I only choose one instead of reading them all, which is the Catholic tradition. But this is the Gospel chosen for this date by all churches worldwide, Catholic, Protestant, um, who focus upon this. So as we focus upon the scripture, we are uniting far beyond these walls and embracing all who are in Christian worship on this very day. We hear two phrases, and I want to make this abundantly clear, two phrases in the scripture today. One is born again. The other is the only begotten. Son of God. These have been two tricky points for unity and for many um, Christian movements. Exactly what does this mean? What does born again mean? Well, I'm afraid it's been associated now and has a connotation of just part of Christianity. But these were inspiring words of Jesus that call Nicodemus to see what it is to be born as a human, born of the flesh, and what it is to be born of spirit. Born again? Or another translation of these words is to be born upon high. Born upon high. So we might go around and decide here at Unity that we'll just go out in the community and tell everybody that we're, we're born on high Christians. But I'm afraid that on high with our friends in Colorado, it may, may become confusing to others. But I invite you to make sure that both born again 
and the Son only begotten of God have a distinct and powerful meaning for you. And so we read from the Gospel of John. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born again when they are old, Nicodemus said. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus said? You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life through him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And so we have the reading of God's word through the Gospel of John. Today, we're going to talk about, oh, there we go, Little Me, not Many Me, that's another movie. <laughs> Little Me and really big me. What does this mean? Well, I realized recently that it might be good if we looked at a really fundamental teaching in unity. Not so much a teaching as a distinction, as a definition of terms. A definition of terms given by our early teacher, Dr. H. Emily Cady, in Lessons in Truth. Now, you know that I mentioned Charles Fillmore and Myrtle Fillmore many times in many of their writings, but we have to address a historical fact that the writings of Emily Cady, primarily Lessons in Truth, but they, she had two other volumes, and the work of the Fillmore's son, Lowell Fillmore, were actually far more widely read than the writings of Charles and Myrtle. To date, I believe two and a half million copies have been sold of Lessons in Truth for more than a hundred and, help me, 120 years now, Lessons in Truth has been a primary teaching of unity. And I've always liked that because if we look at many of the world's organizations, usually the person that's deemed the leader of that organization 
makes sure that their name is on the primary teaching. And here Myrtle Fillmore in the 1890s was so moved by an essay she saw by a homeopathic physician in New York City by the name of H. Emily Cady that they approached Dr. Cady and said, would you write some really basic lessons and truth for our Unity magazine? And they were so popular that by the turn of the century they were compiled into a book form, now selling in millions of copies. And Dr. Katie, I have noticed in my many years in Unity, had the remarkable ability, even in the 1890s, to address some of the questions, challenges, and confusions that people in New Thought and Unity, students of truth, have found a challenge for a whole century. She seemed to be one of those people that just got to the stumbling blocks real quick and easy. One of her important definitions that is not a rule but is an understanding of how we define ourselves is the distinction she makes between personality and individuality. If you're a studier of the great Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Jung, you know he used the term individuation. But for Dr. Katie it was individuality. And this was another way of her expressing this only begotten God, excuse me, only begotten of God quality within each one of God's children. She described the individuality as that which never changes, is never sick. Where's my friend Larry Hall? It never ages. It is the perfect ideal of us, not yet fully expressed in my life. This was the distinction the Fillmore's made of Jesus as, of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, as our master teacher. That they understood that he was the greatest example, the fullest expression of this perfect idea of being. And that's why they designated Jesus Christ, his teachings as we have them recorded in the Gospels as Unity's primary teaching method. Now isn't it interesting through the years that friends that have wanted to call Unity a cult in a derogatory way, not a complimentary one. I used to like to play word games and people say, why Unity's a cult? And I said, do you know what Webster's Dictionary of a cult is? A Webster's Dictionary definition of a cult is, and they'd go, well, no. And I said, look it up. Number one is any organized religion is a cult. That's the old meaning of the word. An organized body of teaching was a cultus. But that's not how they were. They were name calling when they call unity a cult. And one of the challenges is that unity doesn't teach the Bible. It has always been our primary teaching tool. And secondly, unity put tremendous effort for 10 years through the 1920s in producing the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, which takes every proper name in the Bible and gives you a beginning way to inwardly experience that character or that place. Larry thinks it's funny and practical, but I actually do it for a symbolic reason that our Bible on the altar is propped up by a Unity Metaphysical Bible Dictionary behind it. It's to give a way to understand the teachings in the Bible. 
Now this lesson today, Big Me and Little Me, did you have perhaps this morning or perhaps this weekend or at least sometime in this past week a little me experience? Oh, come on. We all know little me, that little part of our personality that is engaged only in the moment. It wants what it wants right now. It's all about me. Well, no, that's how we engage in the immediate, in the moment. And we engage through our feelings. We do what feels right. We want what would feel good and wholesome there. But then we have the big me moment. I'll tell you how I discovered it. Once again, it was in my year of discovery in 2012 when I was in Switzerland, and I journeyed not far to the beautiful um, city of Zurich. Um, and there I was wandering through a neighborhood. And at the time, I was 57 or something or other. And I was wandering through this very artsy, trendy neighborhood, and I thought, I wonder if I can find the hotel where my family stayed when I was about seven years old in the same neighborhood. Well, I remembered it was the Hotel Rothaus. Now, if that sounds a little odd, it's because in Swiss German, Rothaus means town hall. So it was in the neighborhood of the town hall, hence its name. But I did find it, even though the name had changed. Something hadn't changed. This lovely hotel run by a British couple on the first floor was a nightclub. And I can still remember to this day, you walked in the front door and down a narrow hall to a stair to this charming hotel upstairs with this very proper. But you had to walk through a hall covered with photographs of all the women that worked in the nightclub displaying their charms. <laughs> well, my mother was from Missouri. <laughs> she was a bit concerned about the hotel my father had chosen. He liked to find interesting, creative places to stay, and this one was very special. <laughs> but out in front of the hotel was a beautiful fountain. And I recognized the fountain from my childhood. And then all of a sudden it flashed before me. A child of seven being in this beautiful city and then through the years that followed, I could see the adventures that took me to walk up the four-foot tunnel that went for a great distance until it led in to the burial chamber of the Pharaoh of Cheops in the Great Pyramid in Egypt. Standing before the walls, what's left of Jericho. Traveling east and seeing the great, powerful red square of Moscow. The Parthenon in Athens. Climbing the dome of St. Peter's, being on top of that very strange World's Fair object called the Eiffel Tower, standing on the furthest point west of Europe in Portugal, where you're almost at a point looking at the great Atlantic Ocean and all that was to the west. Now, I bring these names up because I will know you will recognize these places or have perhaps been there. But the idea is to realize that through this great capacity God has given us of memory, of memory, we can call forth the experiences of life into the big me. I realized in Zurich, standing before this beautiful gushing fountain, 
that my life was a flowing forth like a gushing fountain. It was not the little me who was lost in the moment in aisle three at Woods this morning. There was a bigger me filled with human experience that at its best was wisdom. I could see all that my life was. A great big fat me. Huge. Abundant. And I had access through memory to that. But now the question becomes, we've got little James and big fat James. Is that all there is to James? Well, we have this teaching in unity, not uniquely our own, but we focus and make it important, of the individuality, the spark of the divine within each and every one of us. There's no exception. To use traditional Christian language, it is something that you have not earned. It is the gift of God. It's God's presence within you. This is a power that unites us no matter how interesting our life may have been to this point. It unites us with something greater. It is the power that unites our work in this world with working toward the good and the true, to working for something that is a greater good than our own immediate concerns. Now, many of you took a lesson or took a class last fall, I know some of you did, called Stairway of Surprise. And in it, was the most mysterious little spiritual practice. And perhaps some of you worked with it for a while, and if you're still working with it a year later, hallelujah. It was a practice of will. Because exercising our free will and choosing to do the will of truth is the greatest work of the human being. But we have to strengthen our will. Charles Fillmore told us long ago that he said Americans consider themselves most free. And he said they absolutely aren't. He said so many Americans look to experts professionals, others to make decisions about their life. A free individual makes their own decisions because they are, know that they are guided by this individuality, this inner Christ, the spark of truth within them. It's their power to meet. It is, returning to Emily Cady, their all-sufficiency and all things. So I invite us now to turn to a time within and to affirm that as we are created only of God, of life, we are empowered with all that we need to meet this life and to meet it with victory and to work toward the good. So I invite you to close your eyes, again allowing your attention to turn within. We can begin with that powerful statement of Jesus, 
that came at his time of greatest trial, not at a party, not at a time of R&R, &R, but a time of his trial. And the Christ within him realized, not my will, but thy will be done. Our greatest opportunity in this world is to bring forth God's will, God's truth, God's life, to bring forth what we call in unity divine ideas and to give them expression through our work our relationships, even our words. Inwardly we can affirm, center ourselves in this statement, I will to do divine will. I will to do divine will. As we freely choose to work toward a common good, a greater good, we move beyond the concerns of little me. As we freely choose to work toward a common good, we even move beyond the wisdom and the perspective of the big me, of the personality involved, evolved throughout our lifetime. But as we are willing to make our attempt, however small, to bring a divine idea, a spiritual principle into expression in our relationships and all that we do in the world. We are connecting ourselves with something greater, our higher self, our individuality, that makes us in truth born again. Born of the Spirit. Born on high. Father, Mother, God, we give thanks for the wondrous way in which you have fashioned each and every one of your children. An inner matrix or master plan for each that we may call the only begotten. For this truth, we know it as our peace and we know it as our power. We know it as our vision. We will to demonstrate it in the world. 
I will to do divine will to bring spiritual principles into expression enhancing peace expanding love deepening wisdom creating goodwill. For this we say thanks be to God, thanks be to Christ our guide in each and every way. And so it is, and so we say, Amen. <laughs>